Buongiorno. Good morning. So my name is Guillaume Lelarge. I work for Dalibo, which is um, a company who do some consultant work for Postgres. And one of the main questions I get from time to time from our customers is, but how does it work? How can you have something like that, a project that's capable to deliver one release each year with so many features without an organization, without a leader, without um, managers? And the right answer is that there is an organization. There is a lot of work from many people who doesn't work for the same company, but still have the same goal. And this is what this talk will be about. How the project is organized, uh, who are the contributors, and how does it work. So it's not at all a technical, call, a technical talk. It's mostly about the project, how it evolves, and how it works. Um, so, not much about me. The main thing you have to know about me is that I work with Postgres since 2003, I think. I started with the 6.5 release, and I did a lot of translation. Mainly, I translated the PostgreSQL manual into French. I did some other work as a contributor. Right now, I'm the treasurer of PostgreSQL Europe. So, this is what we are going to talk about. The organization through Postgres history, what kind of issues we had and how we fixed them, what kind of tools we use for the development, but also for the organization, what kind of contributors we have, because we have, of course, developers, but we have many other kind of contributors, and we'll then focus on NPOs, on organizations that will help Postgres. So, the evolution. First, Postgres. Postgres is a software. It's a free relational database system. The main uh, opponent is Oracle, which is a really big target. And Postgres is very respectful of standards. As many um, free software, we are really into standards. So, Postgres tries to uh, comply as much as possible with uh, SQL. And it's very respectful of data. It has a great portability, and it has mostly an awesome community. Many times when I talk about Postgres, what people talk about is more about its technical um, advantage. The thing I see the most is how awesome the community is. A bit of history. So, at first, um, there's a guy named Michael um, Stonebreaker who worked on a database project inside the Berkeley University called Ingress. He worked on this um, database system for about 10 years, and then he decided to write a new database engine from scratch. He didn't share a single line of code. He really developed it from scratch. And this new database system was called Postgres. Postgres is just a contraction of post-ingress. 
It was still in the Berkeley University in California. And so at that time, it was not a free software. Two Chinese students added SQL support in 1995. It still wasn't a free software. It's only in 1996 that the University of Berkeley liberates the code so that it could be free. They choose uh, a license, which is a bit like the BSD license, and they rename the project from Postgres to PostgreSQL. And they created an informal group called PGDG, PostgreSQL Global Development Group, that uh, has the copyright on this source. And that's really in 1996 that the source code of Postgres is free. And the first release of Postgres, the 1.0 release, is from 1996. So they choose a license, which is a bit of a mix between the MIT and the BSD license. They created a CVS repository. They created mailing lists. And that's when people could start downloading PostgreSQL source code. The dev cycle in 1996 was pretty simple. You send your patches to a mailing list called PGSQL Hackers. And when a committer has the time to check the patch, to review it, and to make sure it was working OK, then it could commit the patch. There were very few committers at this time, and there were very few patches at this time. Checking a patch consists of mostly six steps. You need to make sure about data consistency. Mostly, you need to make sure that all the proprieties of transaction is checked. You need to make sure that uh, every constraints are applied. So you need to make sure that what's get into the database respect all the constraints. Then you need to make sure that the SQL standard is also applied. You cannot add a new feature in a specific, in a proprietary SQL syntax if you don't respect first the SQL, the usual SQL syntax. You are totally allowed to get um, to add new syntax, but you need to respect the syntax in the, in the standard. Then come performances. You can add many features to Postgres, but you need to make sure that it has the right performances. It's not because you have written a patch that it will be applied in the repository. There are not many committers for Postgres. And so there are not many people who can check if the patch you uh, sent is good or no. If a feature is not interesting for many people, there's a good chance that it won't be accepted because it can contain many bugs. And this maintenance burden is only on a few people, the people who has the right to write into the repository. So only interesting features for many people will be uh, accepted in the repository. For the same reason, the fact that we don't have many people who can commit code in the repository, the code must be simple. You need to be, um, it, you have to be able to understand 
the code so that you can maintain it, you can fix it if someone finds a bug in it. And you need to have documentation. You can have the most interesting feature to add to Postgres. If you don't add documentation, people will not know how to use it. So we've seen many patches get denied because it doesn't have documentation that explains how to use the feature. So for checking a patch, you have the, these six steps. And every time a patch needs to be uh, reviewed, it needs to go through these six steps. Problem is, well, actually, it's not really a problem. The community grows. Features are coming in. People are really interested in using Postgres. And you have many, many more patches coming. On the PostgreSQL project, we have around one new major release, no, so one release with new features every 10 or 12 months. And even if the user base grows, the developer base, and especially the number of committers doesn't grow that much. And we have some problem coming in. We have more developers, but they have less knowledge of all the code in Postgres. We have more supported platforms, but we don't test every of them. If we support another platform, we cannot expect someone to check his patch on every platform that we would, use, we would like. Uh, someone who writes a patch on Linux will not check it on Windows, for example. So, we got a tool, what's called the build farm tool. It's a web app and the client which will compile, install, and do some unit testing to check the code of Postgres. So every time we add code in the repository, the Perl client grabs the new code, compile it, install it on different kind of servers, and we have a web app that will tell us that a particular branch will compile on Windows, on Debian, on Red Hat, on CentOS, on whatever operating system you want to use. So this is a very interesting tool because it will really help developers to understand when we have added a new code, if it will work okay on every platform we support. If it, don't, if it doesn't, we know it the day after, and so we can fix it really, really soon in the development process. And new problems arrive. We have more and more patches, but we still don't have enough committers. So what happens during the 8.3 release? We have a patch waiting list growing as crazy. And some patches are checked very late in the dev cycle. So developers start to get frustrated because their patch are not checked. They don't know if they, it, it will be in the next release or it, the next next release. It also has uh, it also has problems on committers because at the end of the dev cycle they have a lot of patches to check. 
they don't have the time to do it, they understand that developers are going more and more angry about it, and it really uh, puts a burden on the development of the project. And finally, what happens is that instead of releasing the final release at some months, we get delayed and more and more. So, the first solution was to add a new, um, something called the commit fast. For each new patch, we put the patch in a wiki. It was, uh, so the wiki.patchrescale.org. And every two months, patch reviewers worked to empty the patch list. And that worked. Every developer know that they have a review at least two months after they send their patches. And that's much better than before. And it also gives us, uh, give them the possibility to fix their patches and propose a new one that will be checked on the next commit fest. That also helps not to forget some patches because in the previous years, some patches get lost. So we had this in the 8.3 development cycle. In the 9.4 development cycle, we had it a commit fest handler, someone who was there to say, hey, you should review this patch, you should do this. And when there was a review, he was there to um, go to the developers and say, hey, you have a comment, you should fix your patch. And that also helped a bit. There was also some issues with using the wiki uh, to uh, get all the patches. So we created a commitfest web app to help on that. On the 9.0 dev cycle, we also had something called alpha release packaging, but it got uh, skipped quickly after. So we had another solution, add more committers. We had something like, um, I think 17 or 18 committers before the 9.0. There were four new committers in the 9.0 dev cycle, two more in 9.3, one more in 9.6. Now we have 22 active committers. It's much better than what we have during the 8.x releases. One other issue we uh, found, well, the bit form is really a great thing because it helps to check the code. It helps us to uh, check compilation issues, installation issues, and um, it helps us to do unit testing. So in a way, we have something to help us on feature regression. But we don't have anything on performance regression. And that's something that lacks. So another solution is actually would be the performance form. Something, a few servers that will be there to do some new testing on the performance and make sure that adding new features won't be a burden on the performance. This is still under heavy discussion. It's still a work in progress, but we hope to have this very soon now. So as you can see, Postgres, the Postgres project, 
is very well organized. It's not a bunch of developers working on their basements, on their free time. It's a lot of people who try to get organized, who uh, invent new tools or use new tools to help build a great relational database engine. As part of the tools, what do we use? For the compilation, Postgres is written in C language. We try to respect uh, ISO 89. There were some discussion to go beyond that. I don't think it's already uh, validated. We use the standard Linux toolchain, and on Windows, we use Visual C++. The first release of Postgres uh, on Windows used the 2008 Visual C++, but the release after that uh, moved on. On the source repository tool, we used CVS from the beginning, and we used it for a very long time. Actually, it's only on 2010 that we switched completely to Git. And since 2010, we are using Git. We are not using every feature of Git, but at least we, we finally moved from CVS. One question that I get asked a lot is, do we have a bug tracker? We don't. We have a mailing list called pgsql-bugs, where you can send bug reports. But actually, you can do that with all the mailing lists, because most of the developers are um, on every mailing list in Postgres and they read it very frequently. So if you have a bug and you declare it on any of the PGSQL mailing list, you can be sure yet that you have answers. But if you want a formal address for your bug report, it is PGSQL-bugs. And for Fisher request, use the mailing list. Same answer. There were some heavy discussions during the last months about having a real bug tracker, but that's not done yet. How do we communicate with each other? Well, I guess I have exactly the same answer than previously. Mailing lists, mailing lists, mailing lists. Almost all discussions happen on the mailing list. PGSQL hackers for development, and there are many more sp for specific topic mailing lists. You have PGSQL admin for all uh, admin stuff on Postgres. You have PGSQL SQL for writing SQL queries. You have, well, many of them. We also have the commit fest tool that I talked a bit earlier. So it is a web app. It was originally written by Robert Haas in PHP, and it was backed up with a Postgres database. We have a new version written by Magnus Agander in Python, and it looks like this. You have all the patches, their status, who is the author, who is reviewing the patch, if it has been committed or not. And so you have a list of all patches for every commit fest, every two months. So if you need to know what will be in the next release of Postgres, one of the things you can do is go on the commit fest app and check what has been committed. The bit form. So the bit form is two tools. There's a client tool written in Perl that will do all the uh, compilation, installation, and unit testing. 
And there's a web app that shows the results of the compilation on many servers. Right now, we have around 40 servers that compile Postgres every day. On these servers, you have as many operating systems, different kind of compilators, GCC, CC, ICC, etc. You have many distributions, Red Hat, Debian, CentOS, and many versions of these distributions. And some of them use different compilation options. Some of them compile the PL per language, some others don't, etc. We'll now see the various steps of an upgrade. With Postgres, you have two kinds of releases. You have minor releases, which are mostly bug and security fixes, and you have major releases, which are releases with new features. What do we do for a bug fix? When a user complains that it has found a bug, the first thing a developer will do is checking it is actually a bug. If it is a bug, it will fix the release the user is using, and then it will check every other maintained release and fix them. By default, every major release of Postgres is maintained during five years, which means that we have around five maintained major releases, which means that when we find a bug, we usually don't fix it in one release, we fix it in five releases plus the one that is getting developed. How many minor releases we have in a year? We have one minor release every two or three months. Unless we find a major bug, something like data corruption or um, security issue, which will trigger the release immediately. But otherwise, you can count for two or three months before having a new minor release. Major releases takes more time. It's usually every 12 or 15 months. When a new release is down, a new branch is created in the repository, and then the development work can continue for the next release. The patch life cycle. When you want to develop a new feature for Postgres, the first thing you have to do is talk about it in the hacker's mailing list. Talking about it will have many new good things. You will know that nobody is already working on this. You will know if other finds that this is a good idea you will know if there is a better way to do it. So really the first thing to do before starting to work on a patch is talk about it with the other hackers. It helps to find the real issue and it helps to start uh, to understand how to write the patch to fix the issue. And this is, it could be a bit frustrating because it usually takes a lot of time and you don't think you move really, you, you're not, you, you don't think you are really working, you are just chatting. But actually it's 
the most important part of the work. Once you understand how you can do to write the code and fix the issue, writing the code itself will be quick. Once you've written the code, you submit the patch and the hackers list, it will get reviewed, could be reviewed immediately or in the next two months. And then when you get the review, usually you have a few comments saying that you need to fix this or that, or that it lacks documentation or that, well, you have a few comments. And you need to react on them and you need to propose a new patch which fix the comments. Once you fixed all the issue of your patch, it will, it will finally get committed. So we had quite a few alpha releases. It was done after each commit first. It allowed users to test and check new features. It allowed dev to know if there was a bug in a specific alpha releases. But it was really too much work for the packagers. So this isn't done anymore. So during the dev cycle, we have around 10 months of adding new features. And then we hit a date where we decide to stop adding new features. That's what we call the feature freeze. Feature freeze is a time where we will work to fix bug that we can find on the new features. And we, need, we work on stabilizing the release so that it gets really good when we do the final, uh, the final release. So it's a lot of debugging. It's also a lot of work on the documentation. It's work on the translation. And it's work on the advocacy part. It can last three months. During the feature freeze, or right after the feature freeze, we have beta releases. So we don't have the possibility to add new features. We will add new available translations. There will be a source packaging and sometimes binary packaging. And it's really a common effort from users and developers to check the release, to check the features, to make sure that everything is working as it should. So there's a lot of tests on the compilation, on the unit testing, and on the performance. After two or three beta releases, we usually have a release candidate. It's when there's no bug left. There's nothing on the open items list. Usually, it lasts one or two weeks, not more. We have really no bugs in it. Five days before the actual release, the packagers will have the time to build binary packages. So we uh, create Windows installer, RPMs, Debian packages, etc. They have five days to do that. On the release date, there's an international press kit that is sent out. And there's an announce on the website and the mailing list. That's mostly the work of the advocacy team. And that the work they started at the beginning of the feature freeze. So we have a lot of bunch of people working on Postgres. I just spoke about advocacy work. We have a lot of developers, 
But that's not the only guys we have to help uh, to build a new release. So we have different um, level of contributors. First, we have the core team. The core team is actually six people. Tom Lane, Bruce Bamian, Magnus Agander, Dave Page, Josh Berkus, Peter Azenfrut. They are a really small team that are the main contact for security issues, that are choosing the right date for release. And they are there to decide when the community doesn't reach a consensus. Sometimes you need someone to make the call. You have, of course, a lot of code contributors, but all are not really writing code. You have developers who write code, but you have also a reviewer. A reviewer isn't supposed to know how to write code. He's supposed to know how to apply a patch, how to compile Postgres, and check if the feature is working. But he's not supposed to know how to write code. A committer is a developer. He has to know how to write code. He has to know how to read code. And he has the power to push your patch in the central repository. And there are other kinds of contributors. You have the admin team, because we have many web servers, mailing lists, the Git repository. We have many tools installed on many servers, and we need a team that are able to administrate that. We also need a tool, uh, we also need a team that will be able to promote the work of the developers. It's not because you have written the most perfect tool that it will get used. It will get used if people know about that. How people know about that, you need people to write articles, blog posts, uh, speak at different events, write books, anything. We need people to promote the work of the developers. So we have an advocacy team. We have speakers at events. We have translators for the application, for the software, and also for the manual. This is usually what I get when I go to see some of my customers and I say, yes, Postgres is a free project. Anybody can work on it and propose patch and fix things and add features. And they see something really chaotic. Or they see two guys in a basement working on their free time. It doesn't work like that. Of course, some of them, me for example, but many of the contributors do that on their free time. But mostly, they are paid for it. They are paid for their company. They are paid by a customer to write a patch to fix an issue or to add a new feature. So don't think that Postgres is written by people who do that when they have the time for it. They usually do that as their work, their paid work. When I talked a bit about the history of Postgres, I said that in 1996, the code is free. That the work of one guy, Bruce Momian, who convinced the university to free the code. And that was a really good move. In 1996, many people from around the world could download the source code, test, and use it. And starting with 1996, many 
countries can use the code. And so we, we saw a lot of new organizations, meetups. You have meetups in every country. You have it in Italy, you have it in France. In France, we have four cities who do meetups regularly about Postgres. But you have that also in Sweden, in United Kingdom, and in many other countries. You have some national organization. The first one is Japan. Japan started around 1998. They have 3,000 members. They are one of the huge user group of Postgres. France has uh, an NPO since 2004 that help uh, to um, do talks and do events uh, in university. You've got Italian, you've got Russia. In many countries, you have national organizations that helps to build events. And then you have some multinational organizations. For example, you have Postgres Europe. Postgres Europe is a French NPO, which uh, is devoted to promote Postgres in Europe. And it's building an event called PGConf Europe uh, that happens every year and that lasts four days. You have about the same thing in the US, called Postgres US. At the beginning, I told you that I started around 2003, 2004. In 2003, I started working on the translation of Postgres. We had, in France, no organization at this time. And in 2003, I was contacted by someone, my boss, called um, Jean-Paul Argudeau. He's, he was willing to start an organization about Postgres in France. And he wanted to uh, be present on many events we have an event in France called Solution Linux, where uh, we talk about free software. And we did a few events like that uh, about Postgres, but only between French guys. And in 2007, Jean-Paul decided to invite a few people from around the world. And in January 2007, you might recognize some of the guys in this picture. They look much, much younger than now. You have Magnus Agander, you have Derin Gundis, you have Greg Stark, and you have Aikilina Kangas. This picture is from 2007. I think you don't know the other guys. They are French, mostly. Jean-Paul Argudeau, Damien Clochard, Sébastien Lardière, and Stéphane Schimlick. Two weeks after this event, I went to Brussels at Fosden. 2007 was the first time we had a booth at Fosden. And we only had one booth. The booth was held by two German, Andreas Scherbum and Susanne Brecht. They both held the booth, and that's the first time I met them here. So in 2007, that was the first time after three years working for the community that I met members of the community outside of France. In 2007, there was also another event that really helped to build the European community. This was Prato. You might 
recognize this guy. So we had Gabrielli, and we had George Bergus, an American, who came all the way to Prado. I'm sure you don't recognize because it's hidden by Jean-Paul. There's David Petter here. And there are many other guys you might remember. Um, this is Cédric Villemin. I don't remember his name. Frederico Campoli? Yeah. OK. So that was 2007. And that was the first time I've met other members, such as Oleg Bartunov, this young man, Simon Riggs, Greg Stark again, Magnus again, Jean-Paul again, and Dave Page. That was a great time. We had much fun. Andreas, the German guy. So this was really a good time, and we had a lot of discussion on how to build a European community and how to make people from different countries working together and working on an event that will be bigger than everything we've done before. Simon Riggs, once again. And so, after meeting in Prado, we spoke a lot via the mailing list. And in 2008, at FOSDEM, we finally signed the official papers for the PostgreSQL Europe NPO. Damien Clochard worked on the paper on the statutes of the organization. And the first members of the board were Gabriele, Magnus, Andreas, and Dave. And that's where they sign it, in one of the rooms where we had talks during the event. And then we worked very hard to build an event that would last a few days where we would only talk about Postgres. And we had one in Paris, which I was very involved in, in 2009. And I was so much involved in that I couldn't get any pictures of it. So you won't have any pictures of it. The next one was in Stuttgart. That's it. <laughs> Thank you, Harald. <laughs> and we get more and more organized. We even have staff t-shirts. Another guy you should know, Gianni. He was there. During this talk, he was talking about PG chess, a chess game with Postgres. That was awesome. And then 2011, we had new guys coming in. PJ O'Gagan, an Irish, a new plush. I want put any more pictures. I could go on and on like that till now. The only pictures I will give you is this one. We continue to do the work. We have a new event in Tallinn in November this year. This will be the eighth PGConf Europe event. You should be there. It only grows bigger, it only grows better. Come, register. And if you cannot come to Tallinn, there are many, many other events you can go to. There's the PG Day UK in a few days. There's PG Day Russia. There's Progress Open in Texas. And there's Tallinn. And there may be many more while we speak. So go there. Go to events. Meet people. 
share experiences. So as you can see, Postgres is a project which is very much alive. You have many people working on it, not only developers, but translators, organizers, many people. They all are trying to find solution. Solution to problems found by users, solution to help developers, to help the advocacy team. There's a lot of work on the organization. Do we have time for questions or did I miss? Don't tell me you were sleeping. <laughs> It's good? Okay. Well, thank you.